Welcome to Happy Times and Places, a positively inclined Doctor Who episode commentary podcast in which I, Toby Haydoke, watch a Doctor Who story chosen by a friend of mine and I commentate along, dropping in facts and observations, all the while trying to guess what my special guest's favourite thing about each episode might be. Hi Toby, I'm Steve Lyons, I'm a writer of Doctor Who and some other stuff and I would like to challenge you to watch The Sensorites. And welcome back to the final episode of The Sensorites. I was slightly worried. This is the story, after all, that a great many hopeful traveller... Well, they've travelled, hopefully, but they haven't arrived at the end because uh, they give up. Um, This is the story that often scuppers people who've decided to do a... uh, you know, an odyssey, a a, a chronological start to finish watch of Doctor Who. Uh, I did it for my book with uh, Rob Shearman for, um, it was called Running Through Corridors. We still owe you a volume. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I've been talking to Rob recently, actually, though, so hopefully we can start making some progress on that. Uh, Oh, excuse me, I'm yawning. Um, But uh, I'm I'm yawning. That is is my my body deciding to um, sum sum up uh the 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 sensorites in a bodily reaction but i've i've actually rather enjoyed this it's but i found it's its problems have been due to naivety rather than dullness um I've, you know there's been plenty i mean i am looking at it as a kind of you know as as a delve rather than as a piece of entertainment looking at you know patterns and performances and and you know ideas rather than just purely as a piece of entertainment because if i was watching it purely as a piece of entertainment i'd shut up every now and again um but that said i mean i i i on my rewatch, I'd, I I really enjoyed episodes one and two, but then when I came to my commentary, sometimes I don't rewatch before doing the commentary, but I felt I really needed to with this one because it's not a story I'm as familiar with as some others. You know, I've only watched it ten or eleven times. Uh, I I really enjoyed episodes one and two, and then during the commentary, I find, found I struggled a bit during episode two. I I felt myself floundering for something interesting to say. Well, there's no change there, Toby. Uh, thanks very much. Um, but uh, I did the opposite in episode five, is that I, got, I allowed myself to get distracted by, uh, you know, biographical information about Peter Glaze and the uh, the coverage of his death in the newspapers, tying in with uh, what had been said in, uh, you know, the Doctor Who books by Jeremy Bentham, etc. And found myself talking through chat about a weapon and the Doctor... Uh, did you know showing that he was reluctant to hold a weapon and indeed then in a scene has handed that over to ian which ended up being the thing that steve lyons chose to be his thing of interest uh, and i hadn't even spotted because i'd allowed myself to be distracted so there's a lesson there in not sort of coming up with things to talk about because i can't find enough because because i anticipate there won't be enough to discuss from the visual stimuli that i'm getting and actually uh, I, I should trust the material uh, to provide me with enough to talk about and then uh, then I won't go, go then I won't go missing especially in these early stories landmark moments that uh, may not seem very important in in context particularly but in 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 terms of the wider narrative of Doctor Who and how we understand it as a whole and 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 when things started to to be said and done uh, you know, these all of these early stories have their moments uh, of, of either paths not taken or or paths, you know, tentatively being laid. So yeah, so I I screwed up there, which is a shame because I was uh, I was too well up. I could still win this if I get the same thing as Steve. If I choose the same favorite thing as Steve this episode, and the same favorite thing as a whole because we get to choose two this time around our favorite thing from episode six a desperate venture and our favorite thing our bonus favorite thing as a whole so uh, hmm, yeah well let's see but i'm i've done pretty well to um you know i'm not wildly out of tune with uh, steve which is nice because he's a he's a lovely fellow and a smart clever guy and a funny writer so anyway it is episode six of the Sensorites, a desperate venture. Um, I, 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 I had allowed myself to be distracted by Peter Glaze uh, in the previous 
uh, installments, partially because it's always been Peter Glazer and Cracker Jack's in it. We've known that forever because he's even mentioned in Doctor Who Celebration. And nobody's really thought about that one. So I've so I've had a little, you know, I'd, I, I wanted to give him a second glance, as it were. And Peter Crocker, uh, a, a, a picture restorer extraordinaire, has dropped me a couple of messages. I don't know why I saw him the other day. We walked our dogs together. He didn't, but he's 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 put it he's put it on the Patreon, folks, uh, which uh, enables me to plug that. Hooray! Uh, and says uh, Peter Glaze was a seasoned stage comedy performer and was best known to the post-war generation as a twelfth man for the Crazy Gang. Of course, he was all pre crackerjack and of course little if any footage of that part of his career exists he's great as the dog in the hancock episode the bowmans and then he's added another one he was an enthusiastic amateur potter and presented carol ann ford with an ashtray he had made as a gift when he appeared in the sensorites presumably he was also an enthusiastic cigarette smoker now that rings a bell and is probably mentioned in the dvd commentary which is moderated by me but that just goes to show what <laughs> what a nerve i have asking people to remember what they did 40 years previously when i can't remember what they said to me 10 years ago uh, so and and you know I'm I'm supposed to be interested in a way that they're under no obligation to be. So there we go. Uh, thanks to Peter for that. And uh, I mean a, 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 a few we've had a we've I've had a bit of feedback uh, about the sensor rights, which I I sense ah that people have uh, have sort of enjoyed uh, re revisiting. Um, uh, uh, Jack Sharp says, I'd like to say I love this story and I don't think there are any bad stories until the web planet. Uh, I particularly loved your mission to find Peter R. Newman on the DVDs. Bless you. Um, uh, and he likes Susan having uh, the being the unearthly child with psychic powers. The first real evidence, he says, that the Doctor isn't human because some people insist that's not a thing until Pertwee. That's true. And villains who aren't really villains until we find the real villains. Humans are the real monsters after all. Oops, spoilers. Uh, on the William Russell thing, it's sad. I thought he'd get to 100. Gone to the great London 1965 in the sky. Ah, oh, glad we got him in 2022. The thought occurs that this time on Doctor Who began and ended in the... The thought occurs that his time on Doctor Who began and ended in the Whitaker. Obviously, one of those teases in bracket eras. Ah, so that's nice. I'm watching through Sir Lancelot and enjoying how he's just Ian, but knighted by a different king. Ah, oh, thanks, Jack. That's a really lovely message. I'm glad I went back to read that out. Um... Gavin Ware says, lovely thoughts on William Russell. This is this is in response to episode two. I think the first TARDIS crew were probably the very best and Ian was a great hero at a time when the central character was mysterious and dangerous. I remember being really delighted when Ian came back to film, when, when William came back to film linking material for the Crusades VHS box set. I also enjoyed his characterization of the first Doctor when he narrated novelizations and his work for Big Finish. I enjoy the sensorites. I know there are better stories in the first season, but I like the sets on the spaceship, and our regulars always give their all. I'd also like to pick. Up, I'd also like to stick up for poor old Reign of Terror. As always, thank you. Keep up the good work. Highlight of the day: new podcast needs to do well. Put a big bashful there. Go in. Um, Lisa and Andrew. Ah, uh, Lisa, lovely Lisa and Andrew. Uh, I used to do analytical. Oh, this is uh, Andrew Troby. I used to do analytical chemistry in one lab in one lab where the person who'd set up the data spreadsheet for the molybdenum test wasn't that familiar with it and had spelt it molybdenum. Uh, I used to smile and think of the sensorites every time I had to enter the data. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, <laughs> and Guy Lambert's responded to that. I hope you walked across the lab really slowly and really quietly to honour the name. Good joke. <laughs> guy lovely <laughs> and jason thompson says now it's always going to be molly bedneum in my head maybe it will be not by now maybe the the, the uh the crusade starts here for it to be called molly bedneum <laughs> um lots of uh lots of uh uh acknowledgements to to william russell william russell being missed here from andrew llewellyn um and uh uh, Michael Herbert says, I started watching in November 63, aged eight, and continued watching for many years after. The first TARDIS crew, the Doctor, Ian, Susan and Barbara, is indelibly printed on my memory, for which I'll always be grateful. Lucky enough to see some lost episodes. Oh, Michael, I am very jealous. Thank you, William Russell, for many hours of pleasure, both on Sir Lancelot and Doctor Who. And Michael is the, uh, is the expert on Malcolm Hulk, 
and doesn't live far from me. There seems to be uh, the, the world of Doctor Who seems to. I was working my dog the other day with Peter Crocker and with uh, uh, Anne Marie Walsh, who is the uh, producer director of uh, the missing episode audios who just happens to live like 10 minutes away and and michael is not that far away uh, i went to borrow some paperwork off him not that long ago because uh, he's uh, he's he's collated loads of stuff over the years and is and is sort of quite academic as well in what he does hi michael um and jason thompson says since you mentioned carol's big hair keep an eye out for her magic changing hairstyle it's different in every episode despite the fact that narratively there is no chance for her to change it. Oh, I, I wish I'd uh, paid proper attention to that, Jason. Um, I might cover that in, because uh, I've got a, 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 the too much information to do on the sense, right? Not too sh sh long a time, actually. And actually, the, the closer I do it to doing this, probably the fresher this will be in my head, so it will probably end up being a better broadcast. Um, and Jason also says, shout out to William Hartnell, realising that when he has to rattle off the melting points of iron and molybdenum, he's actually reciting real world information and some in the audience will spot it if he gets it wrong. So he gets those two numbers bang on. Apparently the work he put into recording, those made him fumble the rest of the line, though. He's brilliant and it's a shame that fandom, especially in the 90s, took the fact he fluffed a few lines here and there and he wasn't even alone in that. And the way he portrayed the Doctor and conflated... And, and, the, and the way he p portrayed the Doctor and conflated the two into a suggestion that all the hums and other mannerisms he very consciously gave the Doctor were just cover for a doddery old man having trouble remembering his lines. Yeah, I mean, I think the... I, I mean, I think there were issues, Jason, but you're right. A lot of it is characterization as well. And it's it's uh, I think it's also um, fun, fun to speculate on uh, on which is what uh, we've got more comments on the sense rights, actually. So uh, let's see. That was sense rights two, sense rights four. what people said about the sense rights for. Uh, 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 oh, there's yes, there's people talking about whether I should whether I should actually do shorter episodes or not, and the uh, consensus is no. Love your waffle, or we wouldn't be listing. <laughs> Says Andrew. Okay, uh, and Michael Herbert. This is interesting. I told you Michael was a good academic. Michael Herbert says he seems to recall that the absence of female sense rights was raised on junior points of view, and the BBC showed a sketch of one. Well, wouldn't that be a marvellous thing to see now? And uh, Sensor Rights 5 got comments. That's, that's the last one I did, isn't it? Sensor Rights 5 uh, has a few comments on it. Uh, online fluffs. The Doctor Who fluffs always draw scorn and jokes, but it was very much part of TV landscape at the time that lines fluffed. There are plenty of examples far worse than anything in Doctor Who. Saying that, the arm cross after the fluff is quite glorious. That's uh, Arthur Mule's big fluff in the last episode. That's from David Gillespie Pratt. Well, yes, David, I mean, there's uh, there's a brilliant moment. Is it on your Twitter? Did you point it out? But there is a, a clip on Twitter of um, Steve Pleitas, Wigner from the 10th Planet, uh, in an episode of The Avengers, uh, which he says the F word, but then on a black man gets him out of the hole and, and they carry on. But he does say the F word under his breath and it's broadcast. Um... Uh, Stephen Moffat, not that one, says thanks, Toby. Loving the Sensorite series. Joe Ford on Hamster did a lovely review of the discontinuity guide this week that develops on your remarks. Worth a listen during your hollybobs. Have a ball. Oh, yes, I went on holiday. But it wasn't really a holiday. It was three days by the coast. I imagined having all sorts of reading and listening and, uh, and I, I didn't do, hardly did anything. <laughs> like, I didn't know. I need another holiday already. Uh, but... Uh, uh, the use of titles such as Second Elder never really occurred to me as humans do it all the time. Prime Minister, Mr President, the VP and especially the military police. After all, we refer to the Brigadier far more often by his title than his name, says Andrew Llewellyn. That's a fair point. I think First and Second Elder is OK. But First Sense Right, Second Sense Right, Third Sense Right, Fourth Sense Right, First Warrior, Second Warrior, First Scientist, Second Scientist. I think, I think that's getting a bit too much. Um, yeah. But I, I do take your point, but it's still bad. <laughs> but, I, you know, amusingly bad. Uh, Chris Williams, thanks, Toby. I caught up and watched the final three episodes last night. Yes, three episodes of The Sense Rights in one night. Unheard of. I think you hit the nail on the head saying that the main problem is the juvenile tone, which is a bit of a hurdle on first viewing. It's almost like someone's idea of science fiction who's only seen a few B-movies or read Dan Dare and the Eagle. There's amazement at sliding doors, ray guns and watches. You don't have to wind up. 
once you get past it there's quite a few plus points especially in episode six which i won't mention uh, it, it preempts it in case it preempts your choices but i've enjoyed watching this one with you probably my least one of my least watched stories maybe you can get me through the web planet next well i have somebody who's nominated the web planet but not recorded their thing uh, so i need to uh, chase them up so there we go that's just a that's just a few of the comments I, I can't find episode three at the moment but um so sorry if i missed yours out but i, I never said i'd read them out anyway but i, I think that's uh, some interesting just because i thought the response of the, the enthusiastic bevy of correspondents who've been uh, watching this along with uh, these commentaries uh, raised a couple of interesting points and observations and showed that uh, everyone you know kind of had a bit of affection for this story so I was going to say maybe I was wrong to come in with such trepidation and uh, and and with such uh, a low, so, so many low expectations, but actually I don't think I was because it is it is still I think generally a story that uh, nobody gets especially overwhelmed by. You can be you can be overwhelmed and you can be underwhelmed. Uh, many people say that they're whelmed though. I was well whelmed by that, <laughs> but anyway, let's see if I can let's see if I can attend to your. The, 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 the status of your whelmness uh, as we watch together the last instalment and Doctor Who is encountering some people who are undertaking a desperate venture in the final 24 minutes and 31 seconds it says here of the Doctor Who story The Sensorites the only Doctor Who story written by Peter R. Newman and we're going to press play in three two one and yeah i'm watching this on uh, on the bbc iplayer and uh, it, it, i will never get uh, i will never get used to the fact that i can just click click on a button and watch really nice quality episodes of doctor who from you know as as far back as these go so here's carol now i haven't taken a note of her hair from uh, from last week so although I, but is that I, I don't even know if that's a, I don't even know if that's a, 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 a you know a, a retake or a, or played in from film uh, let's see what's her hair doing here oh. I'm mesmerized by her hair now uh, <laughs> uh, I, I want to look at other pictures of her hair but there's a thing that you can do if you are, I can see yes that does look a bit different I wonder why that is I wonder, I wonder if she's just very changeable or whether nobody was paying attention or whether every week she watched it and went oh no I need better hair next time uh, she was up for one of the Avengers uh, I'll use the parlance of the time the Avengers girls wasn't she uh, Ilona she's uh, uh and, and uh, as I, I, I may have mentioned, I remember her popping up in an Australian series called Anzacs that was shown in the early 80s. And, you know, again, as a, as a cast list reader, I was like, well, there won't be many there won't be many Doctor Who people in this because it's Australian. And Ilona Rogers is in it. Uh, Reese McConaughey from uh, another New Zealander, I think Reese McConaughey is from um, from the enemy of the world popped up in it playing Lloyd George, I think a good part. Uh, gets his name at the beginning credits. So and and Ed Ed Pegg from the Invisible Enemy turned up in it as well. So so so, so I went from thinking uh, nobody, uh, you know, nobody from Doctor Who is going to appear in this. When every it seemed to be everybody from Australia or New Zealand that had been in Doctor Who uh, was 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 uh, snaffled for Anzacs, and, and suddenly the television world seemed very small. All of a sudden, it's John Gregg in it as well. Now John Gregg was in Bodyline, I think. John Gregg who was in. Uh, the Ark in Space is Lysett, who also spent, uh, I think he was Australian. But uh, um, now look, here is Barbara back from her holiday, like me, back from her holiday. But she she's had two weeks rather than the three days that I got. And she's got a tan uh, and is smiling <laughs> and, and doesn't have a pile of things still to do. Um, but it's funny, isn't it? How isn't it? I just think it's rather wonderful how. 
most people watching this probably wouldn't even notice that she's slightly tanned, especially if, you know, if they're watching in the way that we do watch things now, which is, you know, with, with not that much attention to detail. But even if you're just watching it just for the story, I don't think, you know, you'd be thinking you wouldn't be thinking back to three weeks ago. Uh, and especially if you didn't know, you know, because because, you know, take out to the equipment, if anybody that might be watching this this year, say, some of them will just be discovering it for the first time. Some of it will be just people who like Doctor Who and watch it occasionally and sometimes collect the DVDs. Uh, and then there'll be some people watching it, you know, who know the facts. Uh, and then there'll be people who know the facts to such an extent that they'll go, oh, yeah, because she's been on, we know she's been on holiday and, and look at her now and actually then cross-reference that with what she looked like in episode three and go, well, yeah. We we, we we can extrapolate from that that she went somewhere warm got a tan and we can see that's the tan that we can see and she does she looks tanned uh and i love that that we can you know sort of trace trace the activities and and have the ocular proof of them of one of the players of a piece of television that nobody's that excited about from <laughs> five six decades ago Oh, I think they can, First Elder. So look, here Ian is with the two weapons again. Uh, and they've, they've they've been disarmed, so that's... Uh, that actually saves us the dilemma of whether we have our regulars use the guns or not, but it's still... Ian has hold of both of them, and that seems to have been a, a conscious decision from the production team or the actors at the time, say, Doctor Who, you know, the man who had a rock in his hand not that long ago in uh, in paleolithic times now won't even hold the weapons that's interesting everybody's very every everybody says what they think don't they or i mean they sort of give 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 monologues saying what they're going to do uh, <laughs> and I mean, he even turned away to give his monologue. Oh, she will die. He enjoyed that. That was that was quite fun science fiction acting from Arthur Newell. Um, yes. Now, you're, yeah, now you're stuffed. Um, oh, yeah, you could have you could have shouted in the first place. Uh, but anyway, that's fine. Now, I, again, I like these little lines that the, the supplementary uh, sensorites have that I think are. Uh, a slightly uh, 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 give slightly more sort of character to those sorts of characters even ones with names you know the fact that 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 warrior says i've already imprisoned you once you know uh, is 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 a is is a nice little piece of color and and texture that uh, that, as I say, we, we, we've had examples of in previous episodes for those, you know, more supplementary sensorites, which I, I rather like. I think it's 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 an attempt to, you know, give thought and motivation to sort of cipher type characters, which I rather like, which is odd considering the sort of two dimensional nature of some of the motivations and enunciations uh, of, of the characters. So it's it's all goes to show that, you know, just because something is lacking in one area it it doesn't mean it, it it doesn't actually have pleasant surprises in another related but slightly different area unarmed in the aqueduct or oh, you don't want to get caught unarmed in the aqueduct and i love that barbara has come back off her holiday and is immediately sort of in charge and on the ball and going right this is what we got to do um, also quite like the fact they've, they've left Captain Maitland up here, up there, because yeah, you're no use to us, mate. Are you sure I'm no use to you? No, you're not, Captain Maitland. You just stay there. Um, and I, yes, the sensorites sort of talk through why they're doing things uh, in order to tell the children. I still do like the the, the lighting in this uh, uh, in, in this area, although lights uh, come on a bit now. But there is there is a bit of atmosphere to these tiles. And uh, for for this episode for the DVD, I was delighted that we got f uh, f with Frank Cox, we got uh, Giles Fibbs and Martin Huntley, the two the two humans who I was rather delighted. Uh, we'll see them shortly. I think the 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 two sort of Ben Gunn characters. Um, 
had met on this, and Giles had brought a couple of photos that he'd taken because they shared a dressing room, I think. Um, they'd met on this and they'd remained friends to that day. Uh, Giles is sadly no longer with us now. He died a couple, two or three years. He was on Twitter, though, which I thought was rather fun. Uh, but Martin, um, I was very pleased that we got on the Sensorites because he'd not been on the Dalek invasion of Earth, and yet he's a Roboman in uh, all six episodes of that. Um, he's one of the robo, one of the two speaking robo men, along with Peter Badger, in the Dalek Invasion of Earth. But he's not on the DVD of that, um, because that had so many surviving actors. They didn't need well, to go, you know, as far down the cast list as that. I guess. Uh, we, I mean, we definitely would have. Uh, we, we I th- Hartnell says that wrong. I think then doesn't he? Um, and and then um, uh, and then, and then yeah, uh, Martin then comes into the gunfighters as Warren Earp in the last couple of episodes and gets gets killed at the end of episode three. But again, that was one that had quite a lot of surviving actors that we didn't we didn't sort of need to try for him for that, um, for the commentary. Again, if if we'd been budgeted to have a making of as well, which we should have done, because now if we were to do a making of, we would not really have anybody. And at that time, loads of the cast was were still around and we could have tried a bit harder for those we didn't get on that commentary. Um, to be on a on a film of making of, but uh, shall we say there was uh, uh, some th- thrift that was not entirely uh, of the best intentions. Uh, uh, but we'll I'll, I'll maybe talk about that on my deathbed. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we ha- yeah, Martin's not on the gunfighters or the Dalek invasion of Earth. And he's in three Doctor Who stories. So it was at least vital that we got Martin Huntley for for this. And he said yes, and which is interesting because he's never said yes to, to Phantom Films for a signing or, or, or a commentary or anything like that uh, that they've tried to get him for. But uh, he said yes to this and he and, and Giles came along. So whether we caught him in a good mood or whether it's because it was the BBC or, or whether it's because he would be hooking up with, uh, with Giles. But Martin was also very good friends with Peter Badger, uh, who was the uh, other speaking robo man with him in Dalek Invasion of Earth? It's interesting, isn't it? That, that you know they meet on those jobs in the sixties. I know a couple of the Vords who met on the Keys of Marinus, who remained friends for the rest of their lives. And uh, you know, I I think that's very very sweet that you could you know you could work on a job with somebody. You you just assume I would never think to ask an actor. Oh, what do you remember of this person you met? <laughs> on that job you know 60 years ago and yet on those three examples are all examples of people where you absolutely should ask that question because they're still in touch um uh i I like susan's chat with the the first elder because he's such a nice and gentle character we don't come from earth says susan this is this is lovely again she's she's got that lovely far away look the sky is a burnt orange, which I think is now sort of a bit canony, isn't it? Uh, the leaves on the trees are bright silver. There was there was a there was a quote, wasn't there, about if you could see twin suns circling over a blah de blah. Uh, is that in the doc- making of Doctor Who? But it was one that was purported to be from a Doctor Who story, and and uh, and, and actually ended up not being so. But it was it was quoted as being a you know beautiful piece of lyrical Hartnell dialogue. But it's. Uh, it's not actually there, and I think I think before we'd seen some of these stories, I think somebody had maybe watched the sensor rights once and thought, "Oh, it's that bit that Susan does," but it's it's actually not quite the same. Um, but yes, there was it was one of those things before we had the episodes. Did there were sort of mythical quotes that you, you know you, you could think you could say, "Oh, I think that's from an episode," and actually it turns out that it it wasn't. Um, but I remember, I remember those. I remember that that. As I say, that speech, if you could imagine twin suns circling over. I can't remember exactly how it went now. Um, but uh, but now, of course, it's completely irrelevant because we can call up the dialogue. Uh, uh, um, you know, with search engines or with scripts and all that sort of thing. And, and, and none of that is a sort of mystery uh, that needs solving. Uh, whereas in, in those days, uh, you know, a myth could, although that said, myths can uh, uh, myths, myths can uh, get out of hand even even now so uh, m- m- maybe that's maybe that's not 
maybe that's not quite true. But the skies burnt orange with a citadel enclosed in a mighty glass dome shining under the twin suns. That's from that's from Gridlock. Yes. So they do do the twin suns thing. Um, but I'm but but I'm sure that was I'm not going to start searching for it now. I'm sure that's a quote, isn't it? That's in I think in the making of Doctor Who or something uh, that that turned out not to be a quote from from the series and yet the twin suns thing has now been coupled with the bright burnt orange thing in the new series that it's in its way made its way into the show's canon uh yeah love it love it love it love it um if if you don't know what i'm talking about there i've probably made no sense sense whatsoever but i know what i'm talking about and this stuff used to come out of my head and mouth much quicker and clearer I, I, it may not be a holiday I, I need. It may be the last 25 years back. Um, shout out to Norman Kay as well, whose music is is very good. Oh, yes, of course, they've, they're remembering to do the... Uh, oh, Carol's taken a jacket off. Um, uh, the, the, yes, they, I mean, Doctor Who doesn't do this sort of mental communication stuff very often, and I wouldn't want it to. I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to have it in a story about censorites who communicate in this way um uh, to give this story this particular well plot device and vibe but uh, i i'm not generally for people being able to read people's thoughts because it's a it's a bit of a cheat but it works but it works in the context of this and i'm happy for it to be here this is a nice set uh, and yes norman norman k has been a, a good musician for uh for for season one i think he has a, a, there's a real moodiness about uh, about what he does um and i'm glad that john is now you know fully recovered and gets to be a bit heroic yeah, there's a little stumble there from stephen dartnell as uh, as david gillespie perhaps said you know lime fumbles here and there but people fumble lines all the time and i mean i in real life oh that's a nice shot of the you know the camera being sort of full of giles fibsy's back that's that that second human bringing up the rear there is is martin huntley he's got a slight slight lisp and he's very tall and rangy uh of course actors are quite thin now because they they you know go to the gym and starve themselves whereas a lot of actors are thin here because nobody had any money and you know food wasn't as readily available the amount of food that you know we can eat now and snack on and which means that you know it's we we, str we struggle to keep weight off um you know post-war and broke actors i remember philip voss who's in doctor at around this time he's in marco polo telling me that as a young actor you know he was so he was starving hungry he was in pain he was so hungry uh because he was a you know out of work or barely working young actor so you you do get a lot of sort of thin quite thin people and martin martin huntley giles fibs here are both you know very very rangy actors and here suddenly we got i mean he does this in the horns of naimon as well he suddenly ups the acting quality by about 50 percent it's the mighty john bailey who has a beautiful broken quality to his voice a slight readiness a slight cracked quality that uh, makes him very good at slightly forlorn characters although he does a great turn in dennis potter's vote 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 for nigel barton as the uh, as the cynical election agent jack hey jack hey jack may jack hey um but here he's a kind of yeah he's He's the king of the Ben Guns. He's uh, he's he's continuing to fight his war, and he's speak. You know, there's a there's a there's a warped dignity. The fact that he's talking about morale being very high, and he's got this sort of uh, and, and and the fact that Ian so beautifully, absolutely, you know, cottons on what needs to be done here is to play along, give him the respect that he wants, call him sir they're so kind there's no hint that they're you know this is this is the bad guy and there's no hint that they're not sympathetic to him uh and they know that they have to play along but he's got he's got quite sad eyes hasn't he john bailey uh and, and 
and yes, he's. Uh, and I like this the way that he suddenly gets a bit suspicious, and he's you know so he's sympathetic, but he's dangerous because you know he's because he, he's 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 almost got a child's emotions because he's been you know he's been hiding away you know continuing his war like one of those fabled uh, you know japanese soldiers who carried on fighting the the second world war for 30 or 40 years or whatever because they no orders had come through to tell them to stop uh and 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 he's done that and he's now you know he's this sort of broken figure uh just doggedly continuing the only thing that makes sense to him which is you know continuing his his mission it's a brilliant idea i think it's a lovely idea and it's rather sad and john bailey is perfectly perfectly cast uh sort of you know yeah he's he's doing it all in military terms uh be a court-martial I love the fact they just sort of walk in from... It's like they've come in from behind the cameras, which essentially they have. Uh, and, yeah, and I, I mean... The, 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 and this is the... I mean, we could have done of more of this kind of aspect of the plot, although you need this reveal in episode six, but it suddenly, I think, ups the quality of the story quite, quite hugely that you've got this excellent actor, John Bailey, also, of course, uh, Edward Waterfield in Evil of the Daleks. So uh, he's, uh, he's, 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 got, he's got three Doctor Who stories of varying quality between. He starts in the sense right w- with a one-episode cameo, uh, then goes to Evil of the Daleks, where he's an important uh, guest actor, and then Horns of Nymon, he turns up, doesn't he, at the... Uh, at, at the end again turns up uh, in episode four uh, to uh, as as also somebody else who's been you know hanging around fighting behind the scenes and um, as, as I say uh, uh, ups ups the quality of acting while he's there uh, so his 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 you know his his best stab at who evil of the Daleks is bookended by two single episode. Uh, you know, important cameos that that sort of d- d- do a do a similar job. Oh, nice, nice job there, Giles Fibbs, who sort of blinked as though he was not quite used to the light. And I actually, it, it's slightly anticlimactic, but I kind of like the fact that they, you know, they both just they both just drop their weapons. They're just both totally drained, and it's not in them. And I think that's rather sweet. Um, Oh, and I love the fact that the Doctor is so sympathetic to him. Um, and again, this they have another lovely moment here, don't they? Um, where it looks like he's been, you know, people used to this sort of thing ago if they, if they killed him. Pitiful fellow. I could have killed him. I wanted to. But that would not be the way, would it? I love that. I love that. The fact is you didn't kill him shows great promise for the future of your people. Now, you know, we're starting to get some, you know, good indications of what we generally think of Doctor Who as being. Now, I know there are examples later on where the Doctor takes life or the series seem to suggest that, you know, if people do bad things, you blow them up. But it's always run through with this, you know, mercy is 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 usually the best option and death is regrettable and sympathy and understanding for your enemies is 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 a more sophisticated response than that of a lot of action adventure heroes etc etc and uh i th- i think it i think it does give the sensorites you know something uh, something of a dignity that 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 shines through and and, and kind of justifies that 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 languid place and it's it's slightly unusual you know the low stakes politicking um i mean you don't even get you don't even get uh, a denouement really for the city administrator do you he doesn't uh, we do, he, you know he he doesn't really get a proper a proper dethroning um i'm sure in a you know in in a more traditional doctor who story he'd they'd have they'd have killed him somehow or uh, but but instead he's kind of you know he's just sort of bundled off, um, 
because we have a new enemy uh, in 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 the last uh, episode. But but which is a really I think a great piece of plotting, and actually, um, you know, Peter R. Newman's uh, excellent uh, f- film Yesterday's Enemy, you know, is is set in uh, the jungle during the war, and uh, you know, so which and it's it's where there's a there's a film of it with. Um, uh, Gordon Jackson and Stanley Baker and all sorts of other people, uh, Guy Rolf, Richard Pascoe. Uh, and that's the piece of work of his that we can see. It was a TV play and then became a film. And the, and the film is very good. Um, but, you know, there's there's there's, you, there's, the, the, there's at least an echo there of, of where he might have got that sort of idea from, of this, of this hidden warfare, you know, uh, the 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 a sort of more uh, a, a battle more to do with subterfuge than with uh, than with the traditional uh, action and battles of, uh, of of this sort of adventure series. So there we have it: a, a very hastily contrived and not very good cliffhanger from one story to the next, where you kind of think they they shouldn't really have bothered; they should have just ended it on a on a joke in a freeze frame but yeah basically doctor who goes oh i'm slightly annoyed with you i'm gonna chuck you off i suppose it it, it reintroduces that spiky dynamic that verity lambert wanted and that uh, that the series was supposed to have so that it wasn't too cozy but it it does seem to have come out of nowhere and whilst i like and admire their desire to have a spiky dynamic um i'm i'm not sure that uh that I don't prefer, actually, the, the, the when everyone's being cosy and nice to each other in, in, in that original quartet. You know, I think it's uh, that 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 is where to me the the charm comes from. Um, um, so, um, but yes, um, poor old poor old Peter Glaze doesn't really get uh, much of a send off there, does he? His uh, his villainy is kind of forgotten about, and uh, and. Uh, the, the, his 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 story is is kind of uh de- dealt dealt with you know off off stage uh ah oh, anyway i wonder what um steve lyons so i'm obviously going to choose for my favorite thing of Episode six of the Sensorites. I am obviously going to choose uh, the um, the John but John Bailey's performance and role and that you know that subplot uh, that that the well it's not the subplot is it really it's the it's that the resolution of of all of the mysteries that have been laid out is that. There were some, and they were referred to, so it was laid on. Uh, you know that the seeds were sown from that in episode one, what six weeks ago. That yes, uh, there, 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 there had been a spaceship there with people, um, but and and so the clues were there if we if we wanted to go looking for them, uh, and and the resolution is that they that that they're played, portrayed very touchingly. Uh, but still with that sense of danger because he's obviously unhinged with a beautiful performance from from John Bailey who is uh, who's definitely the best actor in it um, and he's and he's in about three scenes but uh, way to go to 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 bring it to a satisfying conclusion which I think it does at the expense of poor old Peter Glaze uh, who uh, who's who's scheming oh yes because he's a schemer don't you know is uh, is wrapped up rather ignominiously so we come to the last episode of the sensorites which is a desperate adventure and my favorite thing about this episode uh, is the character of the unnamed commander played by john bailey uh, it's partly the writing it's partly the acting i just feel like we get to know this guy better um with the few lines that he has uh, than we do some of the other characters over the course of six episodes and um, he and his crew are in a really interesting position uh, and I think I would have liked to have seen more of them and maybe uh, a little bit less of the city administrator oh so three all I mean I kind of knew that 
I, I mean, I would have chosen. That's definitely my choice. I didn't have to think twice about choosing a commander. But I suspected that Steve would be choosing that. So I was, I was you know, I was pretty confident, uh, unusually for me under these circumstances. So we're three all. Now we've got to choose the whole thing, the bonus thing about the whole story. And remember, if Steve and I choose the same thing, I've won. I've only won twice. Love and Monsters and A Christmas Carol. Two new episodes. Uh, yeah. Which, you know, are only, you know, there's far less to choose from because they're m much shorter. I mean, here we've got two and a half hours worth of entertainment from which to choose seven things as opposed to, you know, 40 minutes to an hour to choose five. Um, but anyway, I mean, I usually, whatever the odds are, I usually do really badly and quite often can go a whole story without getting anything the same. I was close with the, the very first story as well, with the, 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 the Cave People episodes and Jim Sangster. I'm going to choose, I was going to choose the sensor masks, wasn't I? But I'm going to broaden it out. I think I was thinking about this when I was walking the dog earlier. The great thing and the, the important thing about the sensor rights and it's and it's what and it's what i told that kid in a precocious way at that party all that time ago that made his mum slightly snarky with me was that the sensor rights were the first and the rare at that you know in classic series bill particularly it's more common now where we're encouraged more to empathize with the monsters now i think actually sometimes with um with conflicting and 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 uh, different levels of satisfaction it's you know it's not enough to just say oh we have to sympathize uh and sometimes that's been you know turned against and then you and, and, and then the writers get into trouble because like the gelf seems sympathetic and then oh no that's the twist they turn out to be monsters and then certain commentators go oh that's saying you should you know it, it's fully we we, we 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 let in immigrants and then they're all horrible uh, and you go well no, he might have just been telling a story in which you want wanted nice nice superior monsters to actually be bad bad monsters and wasn't trying to make a point about immigration at all so it's very very difficult whereas but 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 in these times, in the 1960s, in Doctor Who, this new series where there has to be jeopardy, there has to be desperate ventures, there has to be lands of fear, um, uh, to, to have a story where the twist, if you like, is that the alien creatures are benign and good and timid and frightened of noise and frightened of light. And actually any threat comes from a load of humans still waging a war. Yeah, I know we've got a subplot with a man from Crackerjack being scheming. Uh, so there are bad sense rights, but the sense rights themselves are there to show us that not all alien creatures are to be feared and that actually we can frighten alien creatures if we're not careful, that we going about our own business can just by our very nature, the nature of our volume, be terrifying to creatures out there and we must be mindful of that and that difference the differences that we have can frighten us and each other without necessarily those differences being dangerous but they seem dangerous and that's what makes us frightened and when people are frightened they fight each other and those differences make us set us against each other and what we have to do is learn empathy and understanding and to and to uh, uh, and to not assume that that different means bad and as a result for all its naivety for all its childish plotting and two-dimensional characterization largely the sense rights does something really important in doctor who in that it presents us with an alien species really early on that says yeah yeah we're, we're here to have stories about monsters but sometimes the, the ones that look like monsters aren't the bad guys and i think that's a really important part of doctor who's dna and naively done though it may be it's you know it's morality in a baby grow perhaps <laughs> which is what the monsters are wearing um and i do like their masks and i do like the, the way they look as well i think yes the portliness of the actors looks a bit quaint now i don't quite like the plates on their feet even though they stand on each other they're an attempt I think they're, they're a largely successful attempt to do what they try to do, which is present these sort of timid mouse-like creatures with, you know, jet black eyes, you know, used to living in, in, in places that aren't too light and aren't too noisy. 
uh, and I, and I think there's the sort of hair on their faces is really interesting and strange and 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 and, and uh, yeah makes them I think I think they look I think they're a, a, a lovely design and a lovely concept but what they stand for <laughs> even on plates is the idea that Doctor Who monsters aren't all bad and I think that is vital and I think it's lovely that uh, quaint old slow old uncelebrated old the sense rights you know is the is the, is the first to have you know to make that that really important point so that's my bonus thing so that was the sensor rights and my favorite thing about the story overall i would have to say is the sensor rights themselves yes uh, it's the way that they seem to subvert the whole trope of the doctor who monster partly because as we're told they can't run and they all look the same uh, but mainly the way that they're introduced as a, as a huge threat only for us to learn as the story goes on that there are shades of good and bad in them just as there are in the human characters it's an approach that doctor who doesn't take nearly as often as you'd think it might uh, and to see it so early on in this in the series history in in what the third monster story is is really quite surprising yes yes not only is the daft old sensor it's the one for which i I think I took a real step forward in my contribution to docu Doctor Who documentary making and I'm really grateful to it for that and it was a thing that myself and Chris Chapman did and we've just been making a, a show this week um, and we're in pre-production for another. He's just sent me the final edit of another. So the, the silly old sense rights that nobody pays any attention to that I actually thought, you know, we'd we'd I'd get the most fun out of doing that commentary for that very reason because nobody really paid attention to it and we've got loads of people who've not been interviewed before and I went into that with real excitement because nobody talks about the sense rights and as it turned out nobody really still wanted to talk about the sense rights and it was a bit of a slog and I was like oh there we go me expecting something out of the sensor rights and yet it, it still managed it's managed to do it with that documentary and now it's managed to do it with this podcast of mine which is no great shakes I know but it's my little corner of the internet and I win so in frequently and who would ever think that love and monsters the a christmas carol and the sensorites would exist in their own little pocket piece trivial place in doctor who history doctor who is not doctor who history but doctor who adjunct footnote twice removed podcasting history or the history of this podcast um that uh, it would uh, it, it would that, that those three stories would be the one where i i win God bless you, Stephen. Who'd have thought when I was reading your novels as as a student going, I don't really want to watch read Doctor Who novels read by Doctor Who fans. The Doctor Who fans are rubbish. Why are they doing Doctor Who stuff? Doctor Who stuff should be given just to professionals. Well, of course, Steve is a professional and loads of other Doctor Who fans are professionals. That's the people that run the show and have run the show for the past 20 years prove and done loads of other great contributions to the show in various different forms, including playing the Doctor. So, you know, Doctor Who fans can, can do Doctor Who stuff. And Steve's books are great. Uh, and and, I, and, and, and his, his were the ones that I read because I liked his sense of humour um, as and, and his ability to, to meld that into something dramatic and imaginative and then I didn't realise he lived not that far away either as I say it's this sort of weird Doctor Who enclave we have in a in a you know 20-30 mile radius and uh, I'm, I'm sure I will be having curry with Steve at the end of this month uh, with, uh, with Steve and a few others and I will be delighted to tell him uh, oh, and he's been coming to my monthly comedy night at 53.2 as well, testing, testing. So I'll be delighted to tell him that he joins Jason Thompson and Chris Dunford-Kelk as the people I have beaten, thrashed, well, no, narrowly beaten, uh, in the quest for happy times and places to see if I can guess the favourite things that they have chosen. And uh, on this case, I have won four points to three, which... Uh, it's hopefully what the score will be when England take on Spain in the Euros in two days' time. That's going to date that for all the people who uh, who uh, 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 are listening in the future because the patrons will be getting this tonight as I record this. I'm going to put it straight out, uh, but you uh, non-patrons will get it uh, in a few months later. So you will know whether what is coming up 
as I speak on Sunday is a moment in footballing history or just another loss for England. Although, that said, a great many of you won't care. And I'm I'm one of those terrible fly-by-night football fans. I'll watch the international games and get really excited by them and don't give a monkeys the rest of the time. It's like people who only watch Doctor Who when it's an anniversary special. <laughs> those people. I'm one of those people for football. But anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's me beating Steve, but it seems only fair if I now give him uh, a, a, a little coda where he gets his own he gets to end his own story by emerging from hiding, uh, bedraggled and bearded, and explaining uh, what wars he's fighting right now. Which just leaves the uh, obligatory shameless plug. So um, if you'd like to uh, see my latest Doctor Who story, it's uh, an audio drama starring Peter Davison as the Doctor. It's called Ghost Station, part of uh, the Time Apart anthology produced by Big Finish Productions, and you can find out more on their website. Cheers. Now then, I should think that's probably now 100 years old because Steve sent me this during the pandemic. I asked and he, uh, I asked when we were doing, I think, a Doctor Who quiz uh, online, the quiz of Rassilon, and uh, and he was pretty quick with it. So um, I'm sure he's done loads since then. But let's just use that as a as an example of one of the many bits of Doctor Who related work that he's done. But I can heartily recommend all of Steve's stuff. He's a brilliant, brilliant writer. And as I say, crucially, one who has an excellent sense of humour as well. Uh, and you know a really sharp and smart sense of humour, which when 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 you meet him and he's such a sort of quiet and humble sort of chap, uh, is a real surprise because he he can be very waspish on the page. He's great. I've got a lot of time for Steve. I'm so glad uh, he's uh, contributed to this, and I'm even more glad that I beat the guy. Oh, and I didn't mention it at the time, and as one should try and pack these with all the useful information amongst the stuttering segues and waywardness. Um, that the second episode, of course, because we talk about scheduling these days and how vital it is, even though scheduling is now becoming a thing of the past. Um, the second episode of the Sense Rights was twenty was its whole length late. It was twenty five minutes late um, because of grandstand uh, overrunning, uh, and so lost a million viewers actually. And then uh, Hidden Danger episode three was going to run two hours after its scheduled time well no it was scheduled to run two hours later than usual uh, on the 4th of July uh, because of Wimbledon and the Ashes um, it ended up being replaced by Juice, Jukebox Jury and was actually p- postponed till the following week so viewers of the Sense Rights had to wait two weeks between episodes two and three and uh, and, and those tuning in and, and without the internet and all of that sort of thing you'd have you'd have just sort of plonked yourself down to watch Doctor Who and be told no nope, not until next week which I'm sure would have caused many a tantrum I don't think no I think you would have probably just your lip would have wobbled and you'd gone up to her, up to bed very sad <laughs> but yeah so there's there's some interesting trivia for you that perhaps I could have found to mention instead of some of the awful waffle I probably subjected you to in earlier episodes of course, I don't like to let a thing go, so I've just been upstairs and flicked through the making of Doctor Who, both editions, and I can't find that quote. And it's it's not that if you could touch the alien sand and hear the cries of strange birds and watch them wheel in another sky, would that satisfy you from uh, from the first from the first story? It's it, it it's it's a, it's a sort of amalgam of that and Susan's speech in the sense rights. But I'm sure there was a. I'm sure there was a piece of dialogue that actually that that had twin son, sons and something about an alien, an orange sky or an alien silver silver leaves. Oh no, because the silver leaves when they described their home planet as well. I'm sure there was a quote from Doctor Who that from the early years about uh, that was quite poetic that turned out not to be from a story. And I swear I didn't dream it, but it's not in the making of Doctor Who, so I might have just been talking absolute nonsense. And again, this is the sort of thing that a younger me would have uh, would have tripped off my tongue with no issue um and now i've raised it you know, now basically i've just spent ages speculating on a thing that wasn't a thing that may now not have even been a thing in the first place but i'm sure it was a thing that turned out not to be a thing so it's pointless anyway you know you know that thing that turned out not to be true yeah i can't remember what what it what it was so i don't even know why i bothered to mention it well i bothered to mention it because uh, uh, when you're d- 
doing a commentary on a six episode black and white Doctor Who story that nobody talks about much, you need to splurge as much as you can. Not all of it will be satisfying, but uh, the same could be said about the sense rights. I'm saying that I'm falling back on the old, the same could be, I, I actually thoroughly enjoyed watching the sense rights this time around and actually only got caught out a couple of times. I think I got caught out in episode two, having watched the episode and enjoyed it and then not found I didn't have as much to say as I'd hoped I would. And then I got caught out in episode five because I would deliberately distracted myself um, uh, because I thought I need to give Peter Glaze his proper due rather than just fall back on what we've always said about him uh, and, and follow up on what it said in Jeremy Bentham's book about his uh, the tributes to him when he died, mentioning Doctor Who. As I said, I, th- I think that book makes a bit too much of that actually it, it it lists a few things that he was in and includes doctor who but it doesn't doesn't sort of go and he was the city administrator at the sense rights it just lists it in his credits so i think that that makes slightly a bigger thing of it than i think is the implication within the text but that's okay um uh, i think that's probably just jeremy as he's writing it up remembering oh yeah i remember when he died they mentioned doctor who although actually at that time he hadn't died that long ago um so yeah it was just a thing that it hit jeremy's attention so he brought it in because it underlines the importance of doctor who but i don't think in the context it's it's like they were saying and amongst his other memorable things that he did i think they just listed it because it's because it's doctor who and doctor who is a program you listed in people's credit i mean god nowadays um i mean i think nicholas ball died the other day hazel and they described him as eastenders actors nicholas ball if you've been in eastenders or coronation street even if you've won an oscar for a film they'll go coronation street star dies and they'll even do that if it's actually somebody who was an extra in one episode of coronation street 15 years ago uh, and wasn't really an actor but anyway let's not get into that uh the shorthands and lazinesses and vagaries of the national press um i've gone off in all sorts of different directions but you see that's the battle i want i want actors to be written up properly that's the, that's where you'll find me <laughs> you'll find me in the basement of newspapers and media outlets they're still waging my war uh, for them to write up actors properly and do their research <laughs> and, uh, uh, and not do lazy journalism that's that's the battle i'll be i'll be i'll be going on when i'm old and bearded and my clothes are torn and i'm just a wreck although actually as i think my mind has shown i'm not that far off that now but there's life in the old dog yet because i emerge from the sensorites the unassuming sensorites the quiet timid sensorites which i've shone a light on for the past six episodes and we know that they don't really like that but i don't care i'm shining a light and now i'm making a noise it's not what they would have wanted but it's the way i'm gonna celebrate sorry sensorites because i have won this one uh, four points to three uh, against uh, and he's an unwilling warrior himself steve lyons because he's such a nice chap so uh maybe uh, maybe uh, uh, you know it, it it wasn't too difficult a battle but we managed to find uh, i managed to i managed to pick four of the same things Matt, perhaps it's a sign that there aren't a lot of things that that are worth choosing from the sense rights but again not necessarily i because it's a bit like different because the ambassadors of death is, is i think very very good but it, again it has that strange otherness about it the sense rights because it's not a story we know as well because it's probably one that most of us don't return to very often so i think it's one that will always will always reward us because we revisit it so infrequently that it will have surprises along the way and things we didn't notice the last time or things we'd forgotten had happened uh, because it's so long since the last time i think you'll find 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 well, it's a double, I think you'll find, because, well, the first one isn't actually a correction, but uh, uh, because I was going to do and I think you'll find, I can add this right now as well. David Gillespie Pratt, um, Twitter and YouTuber extraordinaire for lovely little bits of ephemera, ephemera and comparison and observation and myth busting and all sorts of other stuff. Check out his X uh, slash Twitter slash YouTube, because... Um, I find his stuff really interesting and, uh, you know, it's it's really nicely put together. But uh, David has added, speaking of Australian TV, Ilona Rogers is one of the small band of Doctor Who actors to appear in Prisoner Cell Block H as the incredibly named Zara Moonbeam. Uh, others include Louise Pio, David Nettheim, John Lee and Peter O'Brien. Oh, well, funny enough, I remember clicking on 
prisoner cell block H, I think for the first time ever, because I always saw it listed in the credits. It was on very late at night, listed in the in the newspapers. It was always on very late at night. And I think pretty much the first person I saw, and I think she was on a TV screen in within the drama, was, was Louise Pio, uh, who I sort of knew from the seeds of death but she didn't look exactly the same and i was i was quite chuffed to have noticed that it was the same person uh, having expected you know tuning into an australian to show to see what it was all about not to have, not to see somebody from doctor who pop up and of course she popped up immediately and then i remember not long after there was an episode on and a funny little character was stopped in the street or, or passed one of the main characters and had a little uh, back and forth with them and he was a sort of noticeable little you know, fun, funny little character part and uh, in the closing credits was credited as Bob Jewell. It was, of course, Robert Jewell, Dalek operator. So uh, so uh, I suddenly thought, oh, God, do I have to watch <laughs> Prisoner Cell Block H now just in case Doctor Who actors turn up? I remember Brian Marshall popping up too, who was in the film of Quatermass uh, and the Pit and was a well-known actor over here and, and, and moved to Australia. Um, David at time, of course, is in Enemy of the World, an Australian actor who presumably was seen for Australian parts in em Enemy of the World but ended up playing Federer. Uh, but presumably that's how he first, you know, got into their got into their orbit. Uh, John Lee, of course, Alidon from the Daleks, uh, who was an Australian, returned home, uh, has also appeared in Neighbours. Uh, so, yes, there's a, there's a subsection of Doctor Who actors that have appeared in Neighbours. And one of those will be mentioned, actually, in the next... Or one of the next couple of new series, uh, Happy Times and Places, that I'm planning to do. And it's not Waters of Mars, which has Peter O'Brien in, who is also in Neighbours. But anyway, we can get on to that at another time. That is uh, that is not an I think you'll find, but it's a, it's a, oh, and you might find this interesting. But I'm not, I'm not doing a blurb for that. And the only reason I'm doing it here is because I want it to do and I think you'll find thanks to the ever reliable uh, Lisa and uh, Troby who are so uh, helpful and kind and knowledgeable and are excellent correspondents uh, do check out their round the archives they are round the archive one on Twitter and they have dug out the uh, bless them they've dug out the um the quote that I was fretting about, and this is the Silver Leaves quote, uh, which is indeed from the making of Doctor Who. I just um, didn't see it as I as I flicked through in a panic last night. It's in the Pertwee version. I I have both. I must have uh, missed it out. And um, but yes, this was a sort of legendary speech that was often talked about, but uh, nobody quite knew exactly where it was from. And in context, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of let you into this sort of slightly forgotten I suspect well it was only half remembered by me little piece of sort of Doctor Who folklore that is now redundant because we can see and hear all the episodes and read all the scripts so we know that this is not true on uh, this page page eight of the Pertwee edition uh, of the making of Doctor Who perhaps the success is to do with that special Doctor Who magic aha indefinable magic we should do a podcast about that in one of the stories write Terence Dix and Malcolm Hulk written by David Whittaker the doctor said can you imagine silver leaves waving above a pool of liquid gold containing singing fishes twin suns there they are that circle and fall in a rainbow heaven Another world in another sky. Well, he doesn't say that. Uh, it's, that's never said in Doctor Who. But uh, yeah, that that was a uh, that was a sort of legendary Doctor speech that never actually happened. I knew I hadn't dreamt it. But there we are. We finally have an answer. Uh, we have some clarity, and it's not one of those podcasts where I, sort of, where what you know, somebody postulates something and then just leaves it hanging unanswered. Uh, so yes, uh, yeah, but and it's it's caused a little bit of. Uh, a little bit of chatter in the uh, in the in the, the the feedback to the to the Patreon publication of this, which uh, just a reminder is always a few months earlier than when you listen to it, uh, you know, when it's out in the open for free. Um, so yes, Peter Crocker had said uh, the twin sons quotation was certainly in the Piccolo making of Doctor Who. Yeah, we've we've got that now. Thanks, Peter. And that edition was mostly written by Malcolm Hulk, with some additions and checking by Terence Dix. The input was reversed on the 1976 revision. Given the book would have been written only eight years after the programme started, I wonder if Hulk lifted that line from his script for The Hidden Planet, 
that he would likely have had to hand at the time. Oh, that's an interesting idea I've not heard uh, suggested anywhere else, although he does attribute it, though, doesn't he, uh, as we've just heard, to to David Whittaker. But there we go. I wonder if it's in a, a sample that Whittaker had sent out when he was giving writer's notes. Who knows? Um, and Jonathan Potter has added, I'm pretty sure that it was a matrix data bank question in DWM around 81, 82, which is likely where you remember it from. JJB was asked to place the quote, and from memory he said, an unearthly child in the sense rights got closest, but there was no direct attribution. Um, yeah, but um, but it, yes, it's definitely it's in the um, it's in it's in the piccolo that 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 the line is is sort of quoted. And as I say, I I'd not quite remembered it exactly right, but it was nice to have it sent to me. Um, while I'm here, I may as well. Uh, because I'm gonna I'm gonna lead this into since recording episode six. I've actually seen Steve Lines twice. Actually, went for a curry with a group of chums, and uh, and then actually Steve, then what, a couple of days later came to a, a comedy show I was doing. So uh, I've I've because he recorded his contribution. He reckons it was before COVID, which is terrifying. I I thought it was during. I thought it was in the early days of COVID, but maybe it wasn't because uh, I certainly. Asked him to do it when we were doing a, a quiz of Rassilon online. Anyway, he's going to end the podcast with a, a more up-to-date plug of some of his work. So uh, we'll catch up with Steve before the end. But before that, I did enjoy uh, Chris Williams uh, sent a message uh, also on the Patreon in response to this episode, which is lovely. Uh, so I'm going to read it out because it's actually nice to hear from other people. So Chris says, I've just remembered Frank Skinner saying by way of stating his fan credentials that when he got the call to be in Mummy on the Orient Express, he was on his tour bus watching the Censorites. Yep, that's what I would have chosen for part six, says Chris. Uh, suddenly in this childish and bit of a silly story, we meet the real enemy and it's a bit more sophisticated than you would have thought. They aren't just evil prospectors trying to make a quick buck but damaged soldiers suffering from a kind of PTSD still bound by their warped version of duty and honour. It's almost a simple thumbnail sketch of General Carrington from The Ambassadors of Death. Plus points for the performance and also the grown-up sympathetic treatment shown towards them by the censorites and the Doctor. They are, after all, murderers, so you expect them in a story of this tone to fall off a cliff and get their just desserts. But no, it surprises you and elevates the whole story. Remember... We are just two decades from World War II, so who knows what experiences would have would make this understanding and compassion resonate with the production team or viewers. Uh, I read that out simply because I thought it was a really thoughtful and intelligent and well put uh, observation about the episode and the themes and the thing that both Steve and I chose as our favourite thing. So uh, an appropriate way to end this uh, this uh, odyssey through the censorites. Uh, for 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 all its strangeness, I thought I thought Chris put that very well. So thanks, Chris. Awaken. You can join in and and, and have your feedback. Which uh, I, I make no promises to read anything out, but um, if if the opportunity avails itself, because I have to do a re-edit or 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 place something in, uh, yeah, I will. I've the look. There's no there's no formula. You, you, it, it, it happens how it happens, and how this one is happening is that we're going to revisit Steve. Uh, many years after he made his, he, he recorded his contribution to um, very, very recently indeed, when uh, I told him the news about the fact that uh, uh, you know I, I uh, had had won for the uh, for the third time ever. Although actually, I got a lovely message. Actually, while I think of it, as I'm here, um, just as I was pottering about tonight, Chris Dunford Kelk, uh, who is one of the other. Uh, people who I uh, was simpatico with because when we did Love and Monsters, that's another one that I won. Uh, Chris says, uh, which I think is, a, 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 again, another neat observation. Chris says, uh, prompted to message by just finishing the sense rights, happy times and places. Different perspective. Steve, that's Steve Lyons on this one. Jason, that's Jason Thompson who did A Christmas Carol. And I, that's Chris himself, uh, have all won alongside you it's everyone else who lost when you didn't match them 
you're succeeding by having a meeting of minds and both showing excellent taste. So that's a very, I mean, in a story that's about, you know, different perspectives, isn't it? And, and respecting uh, <laughs> different perspectives, etc. I, I quite like this reframing of happy times and places from Chris there, that rather than me losing every time because I haven't guessed uh, the same as my guests, in fact, I, I've, uh, I've always, uh, it's, uh, I haven't lost that the guests have lost because they've failed to choose the things that I have chosen. That I mean, that that wasn't the original way I planned it, but I, I think they call it retconning, don't they, Chris? So let's do that. Let's let's retcon it to mean that. But now, uh, after some build up, let us uh, go and meet Steve Lyons in the future from uh, when he opened this podcast uh, and catch up with him. Uh, post me recording this episode and 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 winning the sense rights so over to steve but for me well i'll i'll speak to you next time i never get the chance to do this but it's there's a chance to confront my nemesis who i actually defeated when steve did you, are you aware that you are you are one of only three people that i've beaten in happy times and places i, I believe so yeah I, I like to think of it more as we were both just right Absolutely, yeah. We, we were we were simpatico with the sense rights, but because you recorded it so long ago, you plugged something that is probably a hundred years old now. So, as we're here together now, what have you got that you would like to plug for the listeners who listen when this actually goes out? Okay, well, my most recent Doctor Who stuff. Um, I did a couple of audio books for the BBC at the beginning of the year. One's called The Cuckoo. One's called Escape the Daleks. Uh, and and other than that, all my recent work has been in the Warhammer universe. If there's any crossover with, with your listenership there, well, excellent. So uh, that, I'm glad we got to do that and and redress about because you did yeah. you recorded that during lockdown, I think. I think it might have even been just before that. Oh my God! Oh. So. A lot of water under the bridge, but po fortunately not water poisoned by deadly nightshade. Uh, but thank you, Stephen. May I say what a joy it was to defeat you. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the sense of rights. Ah. <laughs> so, sorry for putting you through that. Loved it. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you. So, so even what Steve admitted was not his favourite story of season one, and that's why he chose it has been i think and and the feedback from uh, the people who've listened so far uh, a, a really rewarding experience so just goes to show that it uh, doesn't matter how how humble and uncelebrated a doctor who story is there's uh, there's always plenty to shout about but but you know obviously obviously not in the presence of the censor rights <laughs> Thanks very much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydock, and my guest, Steve Lyons, who has written extensively for Doctor Who in audio and paper mediums. So check out his work, because it's excellent. I'm grateful to Steve and to the patrons who make these podcasts possible and they include andrew lester andrew llewellyn paul loveday jacob lumley nate lynch simon liss man in a skirt alert philip marsh joe mclachlan glenn mcleod steve manfred nick mellish james meller phil mitchell john molyneux justin e monaghan jim mooney brandon moore ian moore sheila moore mia merch chris murphy paul murphy andrew nixon tom neenan steve o'brien jeremiah o'connor neil o runa brutig olsen mark trevor owen russell parker andy parkinson james Parker. Parsons, Phil Pascoe, Richard Patey, Ken Patterson, John Pettigrew, Steve Phillips, Shane Plays and Kitty Placati. The music is by Dave Gates and the artwork by Dylan Patterson. If you would like your name read out on the credits, then please go to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock and occasionally I might remember to read out your comments as you send feedback, which people do as the episodes drop and uh, we occasionally uncover some useful facts and it's lovely and friendly and uh, just uh, jolly. And uh, yeah, that's part of the bonus of being part of the, the little patron community we have there. You get your name read out in the credits, uh, you get to make feedback and you get exclusive releases. You get advanced releases, you get your own podcast, you get previews of my Blu-ray and DVD extras, uh, exclusive interviews and all sorts of other things. But yeah, you're usually about six months ahead with Happy Times and Places and uh, a couple of episodes ahead each with uh, 
indefinable magic and too much information patreon.com forward slash toby haydoke you can also contribute at ko-fi.com forward slash toby haydoke if there's an episode you occasionally like that you'd buy me like to buy me a coffee for uh but what you can do that costs no money whatsoever just a little bit of your time is go everywhere on the internet and drop off positive comments about these podcasts which go under the umbrella toby haydoke's time travels they're available on apple and podbean and spotify and wherever you're listening now if you can leave a comment and a five star rating that's really helpful they're also now being uploaded onto youtube i have a youtube channel uh, toby haydoke and uh, obviously any comments and thumbs up on those really help with that as well it's not a monetized channel at the moment uh, it, it was and then it wasn't and i don't really understand how it works but obviously the more people that say nice things and go there and do things there the the more i'll be legitimate within the realms of cyberspace <laughs> My quest for legitimacy even extends, of course, to social media where I'm on Instagram at toby.haydoke. I'm on Twitter at Toby Haydoke. These podcasts have their own feed at Haydoke Podcasts and I have a Facebook page as well. So, you know, drop in on all of those because clearly my ego and need for love and attention has not been satisfied, even though I've put myself out there in almost... I haven't TikToked yet. May I, I might, shall I do a TikTok? I don't think I have the energy to do a TikTok, but it's all the rage, so you never know. I could, I could TikTok about the sensorites because who has? Yeah, no, so maybe nobody ever has. Maybe I'm the man to do it, but maybe I, maybe not. <laughs> Well, there we are. Well, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm in an empty house at the moment to um, do all the things that boys do when the girls are away, which is largely watch watch exciting films with guns and explosions. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we do watch a lot of things together, but um, she has a bit of an aversion. No, that's not fair. We've just done all the Mission Impossible films, actually. Um, but she doesn't like she, she she's not wild about darks although we do the dreary scandy drums if it takes 20 episodes and everyone's sad and wears a jumper and it's wet uh we'll, we'll gobble those up but uh, but the more traditional so that she won't watch the professionals to watch anything old actually maybe i need to watch something old maybe i need to crack open a, a juliet bravo <laughs> Or when the boat comes in. I don't have when the boat comes in, but Adam Adamant. Am I in the mood for Adam Adamant? I don't know. I'm going to watch something that I can't watch when there is a boat because she's at a funky showbiz party that I haven't been invited to. She's at a funky showbiz party and I'm watching episode six of The Sensorites. Who in Haydoak Towers would you say is the most successful? Uh, oh, well, perhaps, perhaps. John Bailey is not the only one trying to retain his dignity uh, under very, very considerably trying circumstances. Uh, I, I promise I won't poison the water. Oh, and one more thing. When Steve came to the comedy night the other day, he was with uh, his friend and my friend Jason. And Jason uh, it reminded me, Jason pointed this out to me a while ago, and I, I don't think I've mentioned it in the podcast. So we'll have it as a little post post credits thing because uh, I've already recorded the post credits thing so I'm just going to bung this on the end I'm, it won't be elegant you'll have noticed it wasn't elegant uh, but now I'm explaining why it's not elegant but anyway I thought it was worth adding this is that Jason always thought the sensorites was called uh, that, that they were actually called the sensorities which I have that's not a mistake I made I, I have had other misapprehensions in fact I've, I've done a whole podcast about um uh, you know mispronunciations or, or words that I didn't know were, were quite right and I know mandragora is a is a is a is a is a, is a, a, a favorite for people to get wrong uh, and sonteran and various other things like that but I'd never come across uh, sensorities I still get rebos and ribos mixed up uh, I don't know why uh, you know I can I, I, I could name an uncredited extra but the actual title of a story uh, still still I have to sort of stop and think about but uh, yeah sensorities I can absolutely see it now but it had never crossed my mind to uh, to to pronounce it like that so um, if you, if you are someone who who was a sensorities person well you've just hopefully discovered that you you were not alone